Well, I think we'll get started. Welcome everyone. Um, good evening. My name is Kathy Chan. I am an associate professor at the Faculty of Law here at, at UVic and for the 2022-23 academic year, the acting director of the Center for Studies in Religion and Society. I'd like to open this uh, lecture tonight by acknowledging and respecting the peoples on whose traditional territory the university stands and the Songhe, Susquehannock, and Wasanish peoples who have continuing historical relationships with this land. And I would like to welcome everyone, whether you are here uh, virtually or in person, to our fourth public lecture of uh, the 22-23 academic year. Our speaker today is uh, Dr. Carolyn Whitney Brown. Uh, Carolyn is a Canadian writer, speaker, illustrator, and university teacher. She has a PhD in English literature from Brown and teaches in the Religious Studies Department at St. Jerome's University. Carolyn, as I understand it, lived for several years in the Larsh Daybreak community and came to know Henry Nguyen at that time. So we look forward to hearing from her today on the co-authored book that emerged from that relationship. And we look forward as well to a special uh, guest star appearance, I think, from another member of the University of Victoria, Dr. James Dock. Thanks very much. Thank you. I'm gonna attach this here. Good. Can you all hear me? It's good? Okay. So this will be a sing-along lecture and I'm gonna tell you why. Henry Nouwen, you see with me here in 1984, was a Roman Catholic priest. He was born in 1932 in the Netherlands and he died in 1996. And 26 years after his death, all 40 of his books are still in print. They've sold millions of copies and there are uh, a dozen or so posthumous collections and other articles. Now in the 1960s, he came from Holland to the US to study at the Menninger Clinic. And he was always motivated by a desire for community and solidarity. He marched with Martin Luther King Jr. from Selma when, when King asked religious leaders to come. Uh, he protested nuclear missiles. He spoke passionately for peace to large audiences. And then in the last 10 years of his life, he, um, let's see if I can, oh, why is this? I'm not moving. Oh, those are all those books I mentioned. So in the last 10 years of his life, he moved to L'Arche Daybreak in Richmond Hill near Toronto, living with people with intellectual disabilities. Is there something we can do to get rid of the... Okay, how about that? Is that better? Going? Okay, okay. Uh, living at large daybreak. Um, we knew him well there. He taught us to bless each other. We had a lot of fun together. We lived in the same community for the last six years of his life. And in the last five years of his life, Henry became completely enthralled with a trapeze troupe in a traveling circus named the Flying Rodleys. They were in, in Germany mainly. And he was mesmerized by their artistry, by their physical beauty, uh, their discipline, their joy, their enthusiasm, how they related to each other in performance. He had so much fun watching them that he became friends. He traveled with them. He rented an RV and drove around with them. He planned to write a book about them, and he thought it was going to be his best and most important book ever. And he died, leaving unfinished pieces of it. He wanted it to be a nonfiction or even a novel. And he told friends it was going to be fantastic. Now, just to back up for a minute, in the 70s and 80s, before coming to Large Daybreak, Henry taught at Yale and then Harvard to overflowing classrooms. And he would famously intersperse his lectures with pauses to sing. And that is why, in honor of live performance and Henry's uh, joy of singing, 
we are going to have a sing-along tonight. And to make this as easy as possible, I welcome musician Jamie Dopp to join me. Because, and because this is a lecture at a university, I should add for credibility that our song leader is also a professor in the English department. He's written six books and many articles. He's a published poet, songwriter, accomplished musician. And our song today will be the hit song from 1867. The Daring Young Man on the Flying Trapeze, written soon after Jules Leotard took to the air with his scandalous new outfit, the Leotard, performing on a piece of newly developed swinging equipment named the Flying Trapeze. So please indulge me. Words on the screen. Now I'm forlorn. Like an old coat that's tattered and torn, left in this wide world to fret and to mourn, betrayed by a maid in her teens. Oh, this maid that I loved, she was handsome, and I tried all I knew her to please, but I could not please her one quarter so well as the man on the flying trapeze. Oh, he flies through the air with the greatest of ease. The daring young man on the flying trapeze. His movements are graceful, all the girls he does please. And my love, he's stolen away. Maybe I'll just hold this. It's okay, I can just hold it, it's fine. So this book, my book, was published last March. Better here? Okay. Okay. Okay, we're gonna try that, how's that? Higher? Okay, how's that? Better? Okay. So 20 years after Henry died, his unfinished trapeze stuff was still sitting in the archives and his literary estate asked if I could look at it and think of something to do with it. Well, it wasn't enough to put together a whole book. So it came to me that I couldn't write the book that Henry would have written, but I could tell this fantastic story of Henry and the traveling Rodleys. So I wove his writings into the narrative of the last five years of his life. And especially I frame it with the events of September 16th, uh, 1996. He had arrived in Holland uh, on his way actually to Russia to do a film there. And he checked into a hotel and had chest pains and they called down and the paramedics came and they said, you're having a heart attack. The stairs are too steep. The elevator's too small. We're gonna take you out a window. So Henry was flown out a window, a great defenestration. And in the book then, I framed the book with this defenestration. And during, during this medical emergency, he reflects back on his life. One key discovery for Henry was the relationship between the flyer and the catcher. This is key to him. And as he wrote to his friend, Bart Gavigan, he said, one of the parts of the act that deeply moves me is the long jump. In that act, the flyer flies across the whole span of the circus with outstretched arms and hands to be caught by the catcher on the moving catch bar. The words that really struck me were the words by Rodley himself, the flyer, when I have done my flying, I have to stretch out my hands and trust that the catcher will be there for me. The greatest mistake I can make is to try to catch the catcher. I've thought about these words as words that express the human challenge to trust your neighbor, to trust your God, to trust love, to trust that finally we will be safe. And I should credit um, most of the photos of the Flying Rodleys and many of the photos you'll see today are by, were taken by 
Henry's very good friend, Ron Vandenbosch, who's been very generous about letting me use his photos. The last time that Henry saw the Flying Rodley's trapeze troupe was just weeks before his own sudden death. In July, 1996, he spent several days with them in Germany. It had been more than five years since he first saw their performance and he uh, went to every one of their live performances in those days and he wrote in his journal, I hadn't expected that I would be so moved seeing the Rodleys again, but I found myself crying as I saw them flying and catching under the circus cupola. As I watched them in the air, I felt some of the same profound emotions that I felt when I saw them for the first time with my father in 1991. It is an emotion hard to describe, but it is the emotion coming from the experience of an enfleshed spirituality. Now, Henry was not alone in his fascination. Other Christian spiritual writers have also had a lived experience of the circus that they tried to express in words. American poet Robert Lax, born in 1915, a friend of Thomas Merton's, became friends with the Christianis, uh, one of the most famous circus families of all time. And he traveled with them in the US and in Western Canada in the late 40s. He sometimes even performed as a clown with them. When Henry got excited about the flying trapeze, a friend sent him photocopies of some of Lax's poetry from his book, Circus of the Sun, which he wrote in 1950 then republished in 2000, combined with other circus writings in the book you see there called Circus Days and Nights. And for Lax, the circus spoke of God's act of creation. He invokes Mary, patron and protector of the circus communities. She was called mother of all who traveled down the road. And he calls her lady in his poem, Acrobat's Song, that begins, who is it for whom we now perform, cavorting on wire, for whom does the boy climbing the ladder balance and whirl? For whom, seen or unseen, in a shield of light? Seen or unseen in a shield of light at the tent top where rays stream in, watching the pinwheel turns of the players dancing in light. Lady, we are thy acrobats, jugglers, tumblers, walking on wire, dancing on air, swinging on the high trapeze. We are thy children flying in the air of that smile, rejoicing in light. Lax loved and celebrated the circus because in it he saw a paradigm of what Thomas Aquinas called the act, that is in their performance, the artists reach a moment of enactment when their full potentials are realized and they become connected in some way to divine illumination. Flannery O'Connor wrote several short stories that feature a complex spiritual awakening through the life of a traveling circus, along with sideshows, freaks, traveling circus families, and those who attend the shows. Annie Dillard's magnificent essay, An Expedition to the Pole, builds to a wild, Imagine a scene celebrating a Catholic mass on an ice floe with folk singers, rascally acolytes, polar explorers, and a variety of circus performers. Artist John August Swanson and Henry were friends. Swanson produced a whole series of prints about circus acts, acts and artistry. Sam Keane was a writer, professor, psychologist. He was born within a few months of Henry and strangely, the same year as Henry, 1991, Keane discovered the circus. Except while Henry wanted to get to know the performers, Keane wanted to fly. So he learned to be a flyer and a catcher and he started a circus school. And in 1999, he published Learning to Fly, Reflections on Fear, Trust, and the Joy of Letting Go. William Stringfellow, um, he was born about four years before Henry, American theologian, lawyer, advocate for social justice and world peace, famous, uh, famously um, sheltered uh, Daniel Berrigan when he was running from the FBI, who was arrested at Stringfellow and, and uh, his partner, um, Anthony Townsend's home on Block Island. Like Henry, Stringfellow, became friends with specific artists in a traveling circus, traveled with their circus on several occasions, spanning decades. 
sometimes with his longtime life partner, Anthony. One troop even welcomed him to travel with them for a whole season as their resident theologian. And also like Henry, Stringfellow died, leaving an unfinished circus manuscript. Unlike Henry, he had signed a contract and accepted in advance, and 15 years after doing that, he still hadn't written the book. In, his, in, in the pieces he left, though, he, Stringfellow names the bold confrontation with death, writing, the service the circus does, more so, I regret to say, than the churches do, is to portray openly, dramatically, and humanly that death is in the midst of life. The circus is eschatological parable and social parody. It signals a transcendence of the power of death which exposes this world as it truly is while it pioneers the kingdom. And he sums up his excitement about the circus. This principality, this art, this veritable liturgy, this common enterprise of multifarious creatures called the circus enacts a hope in an immediate and historic sense and simultaneously embodies an ecumenical foresight of radical and wondrous splendor encompassing as it does both empirically and symbolically the scope and diversity of creation. Stringfellow's 1985 memorial service began with spirituals and ended with circus music. Swiss theologian and priest, Hans Urs van Balthasar wrote that Jesus invites you to lose your soul in order to gain it back. He uses the image of a trapeze salto, that leap of the flyer across the tent to the catcher. He wrote, we would then justly be proud that the circus of the human heart, already so rich in extraordinary acrobats, should find its crowning climax in God's salto mortale. But he does not let matters rest there. He sets his death jump up as a model. He lures us from our limits out into the same inevitably deadly adventure. Well, perhaps these writers would help us to understand another curious fact. Did you know that for nearly a century, the US Conference of Catholic Bishops has assigned priests and nuns to go on the road with traveling circuses to help people in those communities nurture and maintain their spiritual life? Even the Pope loves the circus. But lest we think the trapeze imagery is only used for spiritual purposes, it lends itself to humor. Remember Henry's trust the catcher, especially if you cannot trust the catcher. This is a cartoon from 2016. Well, speaking of humor, now it's time to return to our song to verse two. Be ready and pay attention to the lyrics because they are full of humor, pathos, and even a defenestration. Filled her with compliments, kisses, and gin. Started her on the road to ruin. She made the supreme sacrifice. Without any trousseau, she fled in the night. With him with the greatest of ease. From two stories high, he had lowered her down to the ground on his flying trapeze. Oh, he flies through the air with the greatest of ease. The daring young man on the flying trapeze. His movements are graceful, all the girls he does please, and my love, he's stolen away. Curious, how many of you already know this song, The Man on the Flying Trapeze? Yes, no. Henry was born in 1932, just before an absolute deluge of movies featured this song. The Popeye cartoon came, back, came out in 1934, and it was only one of five different movies that year. 
that featured this song. You could, you could hear Clark Gable sing it on a bus in one of the movies. And the song suggests that Jules Leotard's new performance in the 1860s was seen as seductive, encouraging transgressive behaviors with booze and sexual indiscretion. Now the circus maintains that reputation. I suggested to Harper One that we catalog flying, falling, catching, not only as spiritual writing, but also as circus performing arts, just to see if it would get a better audience. And that tiny category made us, for weeks, a number one new release in circus performing arts. There we are. Now, a few weeks later, when I checked in again to see how it was doing, I discovered that it had slipped to eighth place. But interestingly, that placed it between two practical books about sexual bondage and knot tying. A very unlikely story of finding freedom between two books about bondage. Okay, we'll do verse three. There's an alley coming up. This, this song actually is, uh, Carolyn and, and I know this because we sang this at summer camp as kids. So this is like totally channeling uh, campfire ethos, isn't it? The marshmallows uh, afterwards. Yes, but not all the complicated dark verses though. I didn't remember that. <laughs> This one gets really good. This one's going to feature a certain amount of gender confusion as well as economic outrage. Ready? Yeah. I, yeah. Okay. Some months after this, I went to the hall, was greatly surprised to see on the wall a bill in red letters, which did my heart gall that she was appearing with him. He taught her gymnastics and dressed her in tights to help him live at his ease. He'd made her assume a masculine name and now she goes on the trapeze. Well, she floats through the air with the greatest of ease. You'd think her a man on the flying trapeze. Her movements are graceful, all the girls he does please. And that's what became of my love. Yeah, I totally don't remember that verse as a kid. So what is important here in terms of an experience of an enfleshed spirituality? Henry wrote, as the three flyers swung away from the pedestal board, they somersaulted and turned freely in the air, only to be grasped safely by their two catchers. And I somehow caught a glimpse of the mystery of being the beloved, the mystery in which complete freedom and complete bonding are one, and in which letting go of everything and being connected with everything no longer elude each other. In 1984, Henry and the Flying Rodleys were filmed by Henry's friend Bart Gavigan for a short documentary titled Angels Over the Net. In it, Henry speaks about how the Flying Rodleys trapeze performance opened up something quite new in himself. And very recently, Bart talked about that experience decades ago saying that the section of the film that we're gonna watch in a minute almost never happened. And this is how Bart describes Henry the night before. He says, a sort of meltdown, that Henry suddenly had a sort of meltdown right before me, almost like a panic attack. And I didn't quite understand at first, after all, we'd been talking about the journey to the body for about 10 years. And in a way, what happened was that with the Rodleys that took on a new focus and a new energy inside Henry, and he really clarified something and things had become transparent in a new way for him. And suddenly he was just frozen and talking saying, I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't, I can't. My family will be deeply shocked. I'll upset my father, my two brothers. So we just listened, listened as he talked. It was like seeing him slowly come down from a ledge that he was up on. And then finally, he just laughed out loud. And he said, this is completely ridiculous. Of course, I must talk about this. 
It's the thing I really want to talk about when we film tomorrow. It's one of the most important things I want to share with people. So here's what Henry said. And it's, I just think this is interesting. You'd never guess how hard and scary it was for him to articulate this. We get a brief moment here of, of um, Rodley, and hopefully this works. I have been teaching theology at many, many universities, but, uh, but in fact, this, this act is, is telling more about theology than many, many books. And they summarize theology for me in a, in a, in a remarkable way. And in a way, uh, the, the, the Rodleys never would say that of themselves, but they became sort of theology teachers for me, you know what I mean? They, they talk about what life really is about, what really is important. In your walk through life, is this your biggest discovery? Well, it's, it comes at the moment that it is a really new discovery. You know, first I, I, I taught, I loved to teach in universities. And then I, 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 was, I felt I missed something, something of the heart. And so I, I discovered the life of handicapped people. And it was a real discovery. And the handicapped people became also my teachers, the teachers of the heart. And in then, way? in a way that while they can speak, while they cannot explain, they, they tell me something. They tell me that being is more important than doing. They tell me the heart is more important than the mind. They tell me that community is more important than doing things alone. All these, these great, valuable truths, they, these handicapped people taught me without any words. And then a few, later, a few years later, you know, when I, I met the Rodleys and, and I saw their work and I got to know the trapeze world, something, again, something really new happened. It was suddenly as if I discovered the incredible message that the body can give. You know, it's like university was the mind, the life was about the heart, but, but the trapeze was about the body. And the body tells a spiritual story. The body is not just body, it's, a, it's an expression of of, of, the, of the spirit of the human person. And the real spiritual life is an enfleshed life. That's why I believe in the incarnation, that God becomes flesh. God enters into the flesh, into the body. So if you touch a body, in a way, you touch the divine life. There is no divine life outside the body because God decided to dress himself in a body, or to, to become body. So how does the body tell a spiritual story? Let's think about the dilemmas of writing about an enfleshed spirituality. Is it sexual, sensuous? How can one write about a personal, collective, spiritual, physical experience like Henry had watching the trapeze? Catherine Bond Stockton, a professor in, in Utah now, was one of Henry's students at Yale Divinity School and her scholarly work in queer theory and racialized gender um, often circles around these questions. In her 2020 book, Making Out, she calls the first time she kissed a woman a self-defenestration, like flinging herself out a window. There was no going back. Now, Henry was never ready to go that far, but in later years, he often discussed with his close friends whether and when might be the right time to come out as a gay man. Now, I'm going to keep talking while we watch something of what Henry saw. This is, this is the performance that Henry first saw in 1991 of the Flying Rodleys. But of course, just remember, we are watching a poor quality video, and Henry was watching a live performance. Henry was clear that in many, oh, I want it to keep playing just quietly. Let's see. Will it do it for me? Oh, there it is. I did, it's muted. Will that go anyway? 
So Henry was clear that in many ways, his response to the Flying Rodley's performance was a really adolescent response. Over and over, he says it took him back to his 16-year-old self. Um, in 1996, Henry's friend Rod, Fred Rogers invited him to meet his friend Jim Smith in New Mexico. And this is how Henry remembered and wrote down his conversation with Jim Smith in his journal. He said, it became quite a remarkable evening. After dinner, I showed him the video Angels Over the Net about the Flying Rodleys and told him that I always wanted to write a book about them, but I hadn't found the right form. Jim responded quite radically, you must write the book because you've given it so much of your energy and attention. You have to trust your intuition that your friendship with these trapeze artists allows you to say something very important about the meaning of life. I said, yes, indeed, that tuition is deep and strong, but I'm afraid. When I first saw the Rodleys, something very deep and intimate within me was touched. They brought back in a very vivid way, the longings I had as a 17 year old boy for communion, community and intimacy. Much of the longings went underground during my time at the seminary and the university and my many years of teaching. They only manifested themselves in occasional mental wanderings, curiosities, and feelings of anguish. When I went to L'Arche, I allowed all these feelings and emotions and passions to reemerge. But seeing the Rodleys catapulted me in a new consciousness. There in the air, I saw the artistic realization of my deepest yearnings. It was so intense that even today, I do not know, dare to write about it because it requires a radical new step, not only in my writing, but also in my life. Jim said, I knew all this. The video showed it to me. The Rodleys are completing something within you that for many years remained uncompleted. It has to do with your sexuality, your search for community and your deep yearnings for completeness. And Henry later wrote to Jim calling the trapeze a door to walk through together. So is this a kind of coming of age story? I'm gonna show a couple more photos. Once we just watched this last great news, here we go. This was taken in the 1980s and Henry was close friends of uh, someone named uh, Ken Fight, an itinerant clown and storyteller who helped Henry become very free, much more free physically to clown, to, to be differently in his body. And that's important because much biographical writing about Henry since his death has explored his anguish and the demands he made on his friends. And that is true, but that exclusive focus risks missing something, something of Henry's playfulness, something of Henry's hilarity, something of Henry's really uh, appealing energy. So now it's 2022 and Henry's desire to write in a new way about a spiritual bodily experience. Now it seems ahead of its time. These are significant and even trendy questions now. I'll offer just two examples, which just happen to be books I've read in the last few months. Lars Horn, Voice of the Fish. Horn writes, I experience my body as an interiority that radiates. Living for six months in a body that wouldn't adhere to words, that balked at sentences, made me aware of the body as texture, an image, and gesture, rhythm, as a varying weight. After those months of illness, I wanted to write differently. Wanted language and narrative to carry more physicality. Non-binary transmasculine, my gender exists for the most part as unseen, unworded, unintelligible. What might gender look like written beyond the blurring of a male female binary? I'd like to believe that coincidences might be concordances, echoes between bodies, actions at a distance, that faith might occur as movement, an effort towards slowness, softness, towards some kind of breadth. Cole Arthur Riley in This Here Flesh says, I am interested in reclaiming a contemplation that is not exclusive to whiteness, intellectualism, ableism, 
or mere hobby. And as a black woman, I am disinterested in any call to spirituality that divorces my mind from my body, voice, or people. Contemplative spirituality is in black blood, but it is not a spirituality of disembodied, solitary, intellectual musing. It is a way of being together in the clearing, that's a reference to Toni Morrison's beloved, in the clearing with God. And we get there by descending into the stories that reside in our bodies. Okay, I'm gonna show you Henry trying out the trapeze. No. <laughs> so in recent years, there's been a lot of discussion of pedestals, who we put on a pedestal, whether sculptures should be on pedestals, who deserves to be on a pedestal, whether you should topple sculptures and people off of pedestals. <clears throat> Many people still put Henry Nouwen alone on a pedestal as some kind of spiritual master, but that overlooks the truth of his life and community, his deep desire for solidarity and work with others. So did you see that alternative vision of a pedestal? It's somewhere to launch from, a place to be with others. In fact, real friends will throw you off a pedestal. Did you see Rodley gently wrap his arms around Henry, lift him, kick his legs out from under him and drop him off the pedestal? Real friends do that for each other. A pedestal can allow one to leap into new adventures together. And, and you can't hear it, but this video rings with laughter and applause. Henry is not in any way alone. He is delighting everyone around him. The embodied spirituality of the trapeze is not solo. Mary Oliver writes in a poem, I know several lives worth living, Listen, whatever it is you try to do with your life, nothing will ever dazzle you like the dreams of your body, its spirit longing to fly. So I'm going to end by quoting Henry again. He says, it is the emotion hard to describe, but it is the emotion coming from the experience of an enfleshed spirituality. Body and spirit are fully united. The body in its beauty and elegance expresses the spirit of love, friendship, family, and community, and the spirit never leaves the here and now of the body. So that's it. Speaking of embodied friendship and community, I wanna thank Jamie for being here, who responded with his characteristic generosity to my ridiculous idea. I want to thank Ron Vandenbosch for the uh, photos I used and the Henry Nouwen uh, uh, Society for, for the other Henry material I've used. So, thank you. And I hope I've left enough time for some conversation. Well, thank you. I want to thank uh, Carolyn for a really thought-provoking and interesting multimedia presentation. I, I have to, for those of you who are online, I have to uh, uh, convey that uh, it was quite a feat to get multimedia with hybrid, right? Multimedia hybrid is, is, is tricky, but I think that it worked very well, and I hope you were all able to experience um, the great uh, singing. Hopefully you didn't hear too many of us in the audience too closely, because th that was less <laughs> perhaps less uh, harmonious. Um, we do have a little bit of time for questions. It's a little bit tricky because we only have one microphone. So I'm going to propose perhaps, if you don't mind, perhaps you want to just moderate your own questions. Um, Rachel can uh, may have some that come from the, uh, the online forum or uh, if we have any questions from the floor. Do you want to go first? Do you have someone online? Okay. 
Sure, so I will hand it back to you. Uh, yeah, the question is uh, whether Henry impacted the spirituality of the trapeze artists. And absolutely. They, one thing really interesting is that um, Rodley and his, his um, sister are, are, are both in this troupe, and they weren't not religious. They were um, Seventh-day Adventists. And even though they were fifth generation trapeze family, their parents had moved away from the circus and to take on a, a circus career meant they really had to go against their church's sense that this was a dangerous, evil world to be in. And so in a way, Henry's finding a spiritual meaning of what they were doing was really significant to them. Um, and Henry didn't, he said he would have to live with them for a long time to figure out what being a priest in that setting would be but they talked about the larger meaning of their life together, their forgiveness of each other, their constant having to let go of what went wrong and assume the best of each other and climb back up, maybe make mistakes and climb back up in full view and just do it again. And they, they love discussing those things. And Rodley also said that he loved the psychological discussions with Henry that put their, their life into a much bigger perspective. Yeah. Okay, Rachel's asking, how did this project come to be? Um, well, there was this sort of mythic thing that Henry had a book manuscript that was never published. And I didn't have, I had known at daybreak that in our community that Henry was very interested in the trapeze. That was very public. We did several trapeze themed parties for him. One, we even sang a version of the song. We sang, he flies through the air with the greatest of ease to Holland and France and Japan and Belize. His writings are graceful, all the world he does please. And we wish he would come home today. But I didn't, to be honest, it didn't really grab me. I didn't get it. Um, I don't like heights. I don't like suspense. Watching people do scary things isn't, makes me very nervous. Uh, so over 20 years after he died, his, his estate, the Legacy Trust, came to me and they said, you're a writer and you knew Henry well. This stuff's sitting here. Nobody knows what to do with it. It's not quite a book. And yet there's something here. What do you do with it? And I read it and it wasn't the mythic manuscript we thought was there. It was fragments. He, he'd bought a book about writing creative nonfiction. He told people he wanted to write a novel. Um, so he'd written things with more dialogue than usual. He'd written two chapters of a possible book, but that only covered his first week of knowing them. He wrote a journal when he traveled with them. Um, and then there were, there were several efforts at book outlines. Um, there were interviews, the, the film that we saw a piece of, but it wasn't a book. And so, like I said earlier, it, it became apparent to me that I couldn't, I couldn't write the book he would have written. I don't know where it would have gone, um, but, but it seemed like such a great story. And so the book's actually in two voices. It has two different typefaces in it because I wanted, I, I'm enough of a scholar that I knew people who are interested in Henry would want to know what did he write? What are his words and what are my words? And to make sure it's very clear what's my invention. And in a way there's, there's two Henry Nouns here. In, in the book, everything in italic type is Henry's own words, exactly. And I tried not to mess with them. I condensed them sometimes, but I left his odd syntax, the way he wrote it. And, um, but there's also, so that, that really is historically Henry's own writing. But then of course I invent a character named Henry Nowen, who's in the middle of this heart attack. And, and the character I invent, I think has a lot of similarity with someone I knew, but in a way, it's a character trying to guess what went on in his mind, inventing uh, things that might have gone on in his mind, but probably didn't while he was having a heart attack and being pulled out a window. Yeah.
point that this was maybe a coming of age story. So how important do you think this kind of grappling with mortality was to his re-engagement with the body? Because of course I'm struck by you know the fact that the, the, the kind of idea that the body is the expression of spirit for children is so obvious, I think, or with children, it's quite obvious. And when in some ways we lose it as we get older, and it was almost like we came back to that. Um, so I guess I'm putting your question to you and asking you to answer it a little bit more. How much is this a coming of age or a grappling with the mortality story? Maybe I'm putting too many words in your mouth. How much is this a coming of age, grappling with mortality, connection with childhood story? Yeah, is that a... Henry in the, also in the last five, six years of his life wrote a lot about dying. Um, he also stepped over some fears in himself and spoke at two different conferences uh, for, for uh, people with and caring for people with HIV AIDS. And this was in the 90s when um, there wasn't yet a cure and it was a, a massive epidemic. And death was really something he thought a lot about. Um, he didn't expect to die. His dad was 93 when he died. He thought he had decades ahead still. Um, but he was trying to bring his life together and figure something out. And someone asked me whether his attraction to the trapeze was childlike. And in a way it was, it was playful. There was a kind of naivety to it. He was so excited like a big kid, but also, I mean, it was adolescent. It wasn't childlike. It was, it was you know, on the verge of adulthood. And he's, I mean, as, as we saw, he's trying to figure out how to put together pieces of his life that he hasn't been able to claim. Um, in the context of this great sweep of the circus of, of facing death, of taking risks, of knowing you'll fail, of forgiving failure. I don't know if that answers your question. Rachel. Sorry? Paige has a question. It's made clear that Henry had a huge amount of impact on the community. Did he inspire you to try the trapeze, literally or metaphorically? And if so, what did you learn from that experience? Paige asks, did Henry inspire me to try the trapeze literally or metaphorically? Literally not a chance. <laughs> I just really don't like heights. Uh, metaphorically, I don't know. I mean, maybe this, this, um, this book was, for an academic, was a really big venture into something totally different, something that'd be fun to read, something that was full of humor and energy. Um, and I've tried to catch something of its, the energy of live performance as we've done book launches or even in this talk. I've, I've had a lot of fun thinking, how do we, how do we catch the energy of, of, yeah, in a pandemic of live performance, of, of taking a bit of a risk? Uh, what, how can I help people see what Henry saw even a little bit? Um, so in that way, it, it's a, kind of always a, a bit of a technological tightrope as we did today of, uh, and, and putting something out there and seeing if anyone will catch it. I mean, the, the trapeze metaphorically is fantastic. Yeah. Uh, so now it is as many well known, maybe very popular books on the type of spirituality that are connected. Um, and you talked a little bit about how this was pushing him maybe in a new direction and maybe his own words, you know, revelation to some degree. I'm wondering what you saw in the, the manuscripts or um, the things that we don't see, or for those who haven't read the book, like. That is either an advancement or a, a tweak on what we, we saw uh, his teachings before, or, or what this book would have been with just him. Like, if he actually finished the manuscript, if you say something emerging that was maybe different or new, or you know, what would it might have looked like if he had been the editor for a long time? Uh, so, the question is. Um what the book might have looked like if I wasn't co-author, what was emerging for Henry? How was it different from his previous work? Yeah. 
And I mean, the huge thing was that he was trying to write for a much wider audience that his, now he had tried that before. He, his book, Life of the Beloved, he wrote, he was thinking he would write it for a secular Jewish audience and he structured it around the movement of the mass. And that didn't speak to his secular Jewish friends at all, but everybody else loved it. So that was, that was one effort to write for a different audience. He wrote a book called Letters to Mark for his nephew, which was uh, supposed to really attract a, a non-religious young audience. And again, it went right over the heads of his intended audience, but it became a popular book anyway. So, and, and his book, Return of the Prodigal Son was gonna be his entrance into the men's movement. The sort of Robert Bly, Sam Keen kind of thing. It was subtitled a meditation for, I think fathers, sons and brothers or something. Uh, but again, it didn't hit the audience he wanted, but everybody else loved it. And they retitled it, The Story of a Homecoming. So this book, he really wanted to, you know, write for a secular audience, secular, um, whatever that means. He wanted to reach beyond his uh, readers of spiritual writing. But he really, I, I, I don't know what it would have been. I really don't. What he wrote was interesting. He's using imagery that is not in the Christian tradition. It's not, you know, the prodigal son or a Rembrandt painting. It's in motion. It's live performance. It's, it's very bodily. It's very physical. And he just didn't know how to write about it. But he also really, really wanted to grapple with this question of what's a spirituality of the body? What is an enfleshed spirituality? And he wanted to ground it in, in his experience. And he wanted readers not just to catch his ideas, but to somehow catch his experience. And maybe that makes it different than his other books. He, he really avoided writing a book uh, with his ideas in it. In fact, he wrote several outlines that would have been very traditional Henry type books, um, explaining ideas and he didn't write those books. He outlined them and didn't continue, which says to me that he was trying to give readers a different experience, not, not to lay out his thoughts, but to bring them on the inside of something. And he wanted to do that as a story. Yeah. After, sorry, so after this research, did I say it again? Hmm. Did, I, did I encounter places where I recognized embodied spirituality? It's a good question, because it might be that the books I quote by, um, by um, Lars Horn and um, 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 Cole Arthur Riley, I mean, maybe it's jumping out at me now, but I'm finding everywhere people trying to figure out how, how we keep our bodies and our spirits together, how we do it on this planet right now, how we do this in our relationships, how we do this in terms of, of um, breaking down binaries that are uh, limiting and destructive for people. It, it seems I keep running into somehow this question of what an enfleshed spirituality looks like everywhere now, but maybe that's because it's on my mind. One thing that hits me is that I am the age Henry is in this photo, right? And at my age, he let his imagination be absolutely gra gripped by something and just follow it right through. And I find myself really thinking, what, what do I let my imagination be gripped by with that kind of force? What would it look like? And I, I throw that out to all of you too. Like what, just, just to, to have that kind of openness to something touching you and moving you that deeply that you just want to follow that intuition right to the end and see where it takes you. And I find that really fascinating. Any last questions? If not, I actually think that's a really nice point on which to end with an invitation to uh, open our own imaginations and follow a crazy story 
the way that Henry did, the way that Carolyn has done. We're very uh, appreciative uh, to her for having shared it with us and having done it with such uh, style and humor. So uh, maybe just join me in uh, thanking Carolyn again. And I will just take our, our last uh, moment to um, bring your attention to our uh, speaker next week is Catherine Reardon, uh, one of our current uh, graduate students at the CSRS, a graduate student in history. And she is going to be talking about the clash between scientific and religious authority in early Stuart England next week. So we hope to see some of you there. And uh, thanks again for joining us.